The other thing that you can do is that you can have long text documentation. If you want to explain the algorithms in general or the background, say describe what the Laplace equation is, there is something called Sphinx, which is very much based on Python. Um, and this you can write something called Markdown. It's quite simple uh, documentation, actually. But uh, the beautiful, oh, there we are. Uh, the beautiful thing with Markdown is that you can have things like Lattice equations and everything. And then you can have, this is not in the source, but it's pretty much like a simple word processing document. This too is automatically generated if you just run make, uh, make Sphinx. And in addition to make Sphinx, anytime you push this, it will also automatically be built, not just in my local directory, but if you push this up to the repository on GitHub, it will automatically be built at uh, something called readthedocs.org. So the software engineering repository always have up-to-date meta documentation at read the docs. Automatic and free. That's the advantage. All these open source tools, virtually all these sites give you the serv full services for free. So that's roughly the, the first few tools we use to handle documentation. The next thing I'm going to talk a little about, systematic approaches to finding and preventing bugs in your code. Uh, the most important thing is that you should early on in your career learn to write modular code. I know this is boring and it's probably said in the first chapter of your first computer science programming class and you forgot all about it. I did the same thing. And now 25, 30 years later I'm paying the price and we're gradually going back and rereading those first chapters. You need to have strict small modules with clean interfaces. Think of this as small separate boxes. Only the interface to the box matters and it has to be super well documented. You can't have crisscross dependencies all over your code. You, have you should have beautiful strict code organization. You should have policies. Where do you put stuff? How do you name things? In the case of C++, for instance, if I have a module called foo and a class called bar in that, source foo should be the module that's a directory, and then I just have some sort of high-level documentation in Sphinx there. The class bar is then declared in bar.h and then implemented in bar.cpp, and if I have 50 other classes, they again should have corresponding one declaration file and one implementation file. It will make it trivial for me to find that class in the future. The other thing is that you should have tests, both unit tests and regression tests. Do you know, are you experienced at writing tests? So the definition between most people writing tests, they tend to write regression tests. And regression tests, that guarantees that my code, my code this year has exactly the same bugs that it had last year. Which is certainly not bad that I didn't introduce any new bugs at least. But regression tests literally means that I make sure that I got the same result as I had in a previous version of the code. Unit test is slightly different. Um, so if I'm implementing, say, a random number generator, the unit test should be based on the reference implementation, the, the paper and pen implementation of the random number generator, with a particular seed, what are the first 10 random numbers you should get? And then we write a unit test that tests specifically that aspect of the random number generator. It's not just one aspect. I think our ran my random number generator has like 80 unit tests. Every single method and every single aspect of every single method is tested. So we have 100% test coverage. If there is a bug here, our unit test will find it. And there's even a concept called design for testability. The point is when you write code, the first thing you write is the unit test, not the code. And that will fail. And the definition of when your code is done is when the unit test no longer fails. And the unit test only cares for the public interface or API to your classes. The other controversial thing is that we did this a few years ago, but I would strongly encourage you, if you're young now, consider moving to C++ and doing proper class-based modules. Uh, there are tons of fun things you can say about all these languages. I won't have time to go through them. Uh, C++ is dangerous because it's, a, it's basically it's a machine gun type of language. and You can certainly do very bad things with it, but it also for, it makes it possible to enforce many of these things about the data encapsulation, modularization, strict APIs, and in particular, preventing other parts of the code from looking at my internal variables. The case for C++, it's the one language, there are things like threads and multi-core programming. It's a native part of the language. Uh, we've only had that hardware for 20 years, so we've, it's maybe, apparently it's asking a little bit too much to argue that threads and atomics should be part of the language. It is part of modern C++. Uh, you have the standard template library. It's a very strongly typed language, but I, as an HPC person, I like that this is a super low level pro language. I can access the exact data placement and SIMD intrinsics and everything. Uh, 
we don't use pointers anymore. Uh, there is very advanced support for parallelization libraries, Intel TBB, for instance, task-based parallelism, uh, the type of parallelisms that goes beyond MPI and OpenHSC. And there is a lot of work in the C++ standardization committees on parallel standard template libraries. So I suspect by the time we get to C++ 20 or 21, many of these things will even, many of the parallelization algorithms is not going to be an inherent part of the language. Um, so it's very rapidly developing compared to either C or Fortran. But of course, it's a large and difficult language to master. Just to give you, I realize many of you are not C++ programmers. I'm not going to go through the details here, but if you compare the old way of a mutex, it's a, it's a way of locking access to a data member to guarantee that only one thread at a time will access it. If you do this in C, it's horrible because you have to remember to unlock your mutexes too, or you end up with these uh, race conditions, and, uh, or you, in worst case, you have a complete lock and that nothing is happening. These problems are horrible to debug because if you run them on the debugger, suddenly everything works fine because it depends on the timing in the code. It's not reproducible. Uh, and with C, you would end up with long, uh, long locks and unlocks all the time. You need to initialize your mutex and everything. C++ makes it possible to hide virtually all of these things. So when you just enter a region here, I lock it, and then I do some stuff here. And then when this so-called, you say that they go out of scope. When this region ends here, well, the class, the destructor will be called here, and that will make sure that this mutex is automatically unlocked again. So on the high level as a user here, I will never have to worry about my locks. I just lock it when I need it to be safe, and the unlock will happen automatically. There are even cooler things you can do in C++ that you will handle. You can even copy a lock and everything, um, and with things like shared pointers and everything. It's slightly more advanced, so I won't go through that here. The other thing that might be a surprise to you that why we love C++ is that it's faster. It can frequently be faster than either C or Fortran. So for a long time, we achieve speed in our inner kernels by not having any conditionals. Conditionals break the pipelining of modern processors. But since we also need different settings, we need, like we generate our kernels with a Python code base or something and have like two, three hundred different small kernels, which is a pain to maintain. Uh, in, if you don't maintain that though, you would need to have some sort of conditionals. In C or Fortran, these conditionals would be in the code and make it there would be actually be variables here, and that means that the compiler could not optimize away any of these. With C++, we can make those choices template parameters, and when they are template parameters, the compilers will actually expand this at compile time into different functions. So every single conditional here will be removed, and you're not gonna have any diverging pipelines in the code. This code will actually be one order of magnitude faster in C++ than C or Fortran. So that you have all these neat things that the compiler can help you do, that is not present in C or Fortran. You can certainly screw up C++ too by copying and uh, not using move semantics, but that's a separate story. The other problem that if you look at a general HPC code is that they, sadly, even if they are somehow modular, they are likely gonna have dependencies that look something like this, that everything depends on everything. Uh, the great thing with that is that if you have a bug, you know that it is somewhere. And that's all you know. I only have three million lines of code. <laughs> the bug is somewhere, and there are 49 patches, change one page. Uh, there are ways to get around this, and in particular, Doxygen help, can help you do it. Uh, the first thing is that you should never have an implementation diagram like this. You should have, the modularization and classes should be a directed acyclic graph, so that this is a high-level class that uses other low-level classes, but you see there are no cycles here. The arrows only go one way. Uh, this is very hard and difficult to do when you program. Uh, the point is that Doxygen will help you do it. Doxygen will, can say that uh, it will warn you about if you have cycles. And again, in our code we detect that, and if anybody tries to upload a change like that, it's not allowed. Um, what that buys you uh, is that you can also have, I'll come back to in a second why this is cool. Uh, what that buys you, actually, each of these small boxes here is a module, right? And if I could test these modules independently, this is gonna help me detect almost automatically where the bug is. To explain that, I have to introduce the testing to you. Um, so this is not the regression testing, but specifically the unit testing. Testing needs small part of the code. 
there are a bunch of different testing frameworks. I happen to like Google Test, so I implemented that in this repository for you. It's portable everywhere, including the K computer, and it's small and simple enough that we can, uh, that we can extend it. Um, nothing wrong with the other ones, but. What you do with, with the testing is that you write small tests, and they're typically five or 10 lines, and this should test, in this case, it's testing a one-dimensional FFT. This is a slightly more advanced test that's testing something with SIMD. Uh, for every single test, I think we have like five, six, seven hundred tests in Gromax right now. When I, whenever I compile the code, I just issue make check to. And then this framework will make sure that all these tests are run. And for every single test, it will report how many of them failed, where did they fail, why did they fail, what was the specific line they failed on. Uh, some of these things might sound really stupid. Why on earth are we testing the rounding mode in SIMD? Um, yeah, that seemed really stupid when I wrote the test until I realized that this found an error that on IBM Power 7 and VMX, they use different rounding modes for their SIMD units versus their non-SIMD hardware. Completely stupid, but that would completely break a whole bunch of our algorithms. So I'm pretty happy that we found that out. Just a few months ago, uh, we got massive amount of failures in all our unit tests when we turn on a new node with Intel AVX 512. The reason for this is apparently that the, the, uh, the default version of the GNU compiler present in Ubuntu 18, they have a bug so that when they try to unroll loops with Intel AVX 512, which will, will do automatically at dash 03, it will introduce horrible bugs. And we would not have found that out uh, unless we had tested on that specific hardware, because in AVX 2 hardware, it works fine. So there are all these, we probably report five compiler bugs per year to the vendors. And then, of course, there are a ton of our own bugs, too. But our own bugs, we tend to find earlier on. So that you need these tests. If you think that you don't need tests, you still have all these bugs. It's just that you're not aware of them. Now, they, these codes should be small and everything. I already think I mentioned that. Uh, but what this now buys you, if I have this class, this abstract analysis data, uh, and then I, there is a bug here. The cool thing is that if I now run through the unit tests, the unit tests, there are five, 600 of them, but a whole lot of them are gonna pass. Uh, but what happens is this. The green tests passed, the red tests failed. Where is the bug? We have three million lines of source code. It just took me 20 seconds to run through all these tests. The bug is likely in this routine, right? Because if this routine fails, it's reasonable that the higher level routines that depended on this module also fail. And that might is probably two, 300 lines of code, but I'm testing things not on the entire file, I'm testing each method. And these methods, they might be 20 lines of code, or 50 in that case. So before I have even opened my code editor, the bug has been isolated to 50 lines of code out of three million. That I will fix over lunch. If you did not have the unit test, you would spend the next two weeks trying to track it down where the bug was. So do you see that it's certainly a bit of pain writing the test, it's a bit of pain integrating this, you just saved yourself two weeks of debug. And this is the payback. You're not gonna spend, how many of you, at least the C programmers, have ever had segmentation faults in your code? <laughs> yeah. I haven't had a segmentation fault in two years in production code. We used to have it before, but not the last two years. We don't have segmentation faults anymore. Because our unit test, test they catch that way before we have segmentation faults. So unless you enjoy debugging segmentation faults, um, if you do, that's perfectly fine. But otherwise, this is an alternative. Uh, if you look into large projects such as Gromax, uh, we actually allow anybody to uh, upload code. But the problem with that is that occasionally you have some bad developers that submit buggy code. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, it has happened more than once. Uh, we have a system for code review. Uh, since we've done this for quite a few years, this was early on, um, we have an external system. Both the GitHub and GitLab have slightly lighter weight built-in version of this. The point is that nobody can commit directly to the repo, which means that we can allow anybody to upload a change. Uh, and then two other developers at least have to look at the code and comment. They frequently find bugs, uh, or at least stupid algorithms. That's something that this appears to be an n-square loop. We should fix that. And then the code goes in. Uh, well, you see the entire process here, but that typically there are like 10 of these per day or something, and then we validate it so that all these, you, every time somebody uploads a change here, this is automatically, all the unit tests and everything I mentioned, 
we run this automatically on a whole bunch of different servers. I'll show you that in a second. And then when two other developers are happy with it, it can go in. Um, the other part with you, uh, sorry, this is exactly the part we use for it, that continuous integration really means that the sec, even if I think that my code is fine and Herman might also think that my code is fine, there might be something both of us are missing, for instance, the compiler bug. So that what you do is that you can have the system that any time a change is uploaded, you automatically run through a whole range of tests. Unit tests, integration tests, you can have modern versions of C-Lang have address sanitizers, memory sanitizers, thread sanitizers, static analyzers that automatically find bugs for you. It's amazing what these tools can do. Uh, and every single patch that is uploaded, we test this on CUDA, on OpenCL, on AVX 512, pretty much every, and ARM. We, test, we have a power server for testing things on. A uh, bunch of different settings and everything. And, well, this is probably my patch, given how much red it is. And it's not until every single field here has to be blue, then the code can be submitted. And then we have some very rare stuff, such as, I think the power one is actually one of them, that we only test once every 24 hours. The point is that if you have open source code, GitHub, you don't need to set up your own servers for this. If your project is open and publicly aware, GitHub will do this for free using Travis CI. I've already done this in the uh, Laplace repo. If you want to show how, if you want to see how it's done, it's like two lines of code. It's trivial. Uh, if you want to do this on GitLab, they can do it in slightly more advanced fashion. But again, walk before you run. Um, you can test your code completely for free at every single change you're doing, and you will instantly be told whether something failed. Most of these participants have issue trackers. Even if you don't feel that you have a whole lot of external users, I would strongly encourage you to use an issue tracker because that's also your own to-do list. So what is that had to be done in what order? And then whenever, when you upload a change, you can also refer back to this particular issue that in this case that it fixes, this closes a few issues, it fixes a few of them and that it might refer to others. And that means that there are hyperlinks in everything that I can go back and check that later on. And for these, again, we use, for the, uh, for the examples of software engineering where I set up for you, we use the built-in one in GitHub. I'm almost done here. I think we might have a few minutes for questions. Um, the other thing that I would strongly encourage you to do, that given that you're in HPC, I would, submit, I would guess that the vast majority of you are working with floating point. How many of you understand IEEE 754 fully? Good, you appear to be honest. Note that I didn't raise my hand either. Floating point is an amazingly cool implementation of modern computers. It's so amazingly cool that anybody who thinks they understand it doesn't understand it at all. Uh, there are, this is a beautiful blog that explains some of the intricacies of modern floating point operations. Uh, floating point is not random. Not at all. You can understand floating point and you can understand the origin of errors in floating point and everything. But it's definitely worth for you trying to understand this. And if you calculate A multiplied by B minus A multiplied by B, you might naively think that the answer to this should be zero. On the vast majority of modern computer, it is not. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to tell you why, but it says in this blog why it's not. Uh, there is another, the David Goldberg text is also very much worth reading. And there are also a whole bunch of books that I can recommend you reading, in particular if you're working with C, Strategies for Refactoring, in particular, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. This is a beautiful book if you already have half a million lines of code and you would like to improve this. You might be part of your team or something and you're now the young person who knows something about software engineering. This has been a miracle for my team. Um, and then uh, the large-scale C++ software designed by John Lakos is also a beautiful book. Um, with that, uh, there are a bunch, I could not have done this myself. In particular, Mark Abraham was the one who have, I've, my team here, Mark, Sillard, Burke, Alexei, they pretty much usually pulled me kicking and streaming with my feet first into this. And I will, I've frequently been the one complaining that we can't take all, all that extra work. And then six months later, we realized, that's funny, we haven't spent any time on debugging lately. I guess we don't really have to spend time on debugging anymore. When you first start doing this, this is going to feel painful. It's going to feel like it slows you down. Long term, this is going to improve your productivity by at least a factor two. And that's why they adopt these proper techniques now while you can before you have a million lines of source code. Uh, we've had a ton of vendors and everything that helped too, but that's not the main thing. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks, Eric. We are starting with a